In this episode, your host Tanisha Haynes invites Captain Juan Sanchez and Miss B. Smith to take a seat at the table. The topic is compassion fatigue, and together they discuss the emotional and physical cost of caring for each other in these difficult times, along with the importance of caring for yourself. So please, won't you take a seat at the table? I must take care of myself first. The conversation for in corrections is not wanting to talk about the traumatic events that you will see daily. Community is what's really going to help us out. We need each other. Welcome to A Seat at the Table, a podcast for public service professionals by public service professionals. This podcast series is presented by Statewide Learning Services, a division of the Office of Management and Enterprise Services. Taking their seats at the table today to discuss compassion fatigue are B. Smith, a teacher at Independence Middle School in Oklahoma City and subject matter expert on suicide prevention, and Juan Sanchez, a captain from the Mabel Bassett Correctional Center in McLeod, Oklahoma. The term compassion fatigue was originally published by C. Joinson, a nurse researching burnout in the emergency department. The research since that time has shown compassion fatigue to affect workers across the spectrum of people-centric industries and to be extremely prevalent among public service professionals. Shed light on this common and debilitating condition, we have with us today public service professionals from across the great state of Oklahoma. We have B. Smith, a teacher at Independence Middle School in Oklahoma City and also a subject matter expert on suicide prevention, as well as Captain Juan Sanchez, a captain at Mabel Bassett Correctional Center in McLeod, Oklahoma. Thank you both for taking the time out of your day to visit with us about this subject that is impacting millions of Oklahoma. For having us here. Glad to be here. So we're just going to jump right in and have this conversation about compassion, fatigue, and burnout. So I want to start off with just hearing from you on what that looks like. What, what would you tell a person who maybe has never heard of compassion, fatigue, or burnout, what it is, and how the two are different? I, I would say uh, when I heard compassion fatigue, I think it's labeled differently from people, uh, such as, well, we don't look at it as, uh, we, we would call in corrections, a bur- getting burned out on something, uh, where it's more of a, a term where we just take it differently. So for us, it looks a little bit different being first responders, uh, where it might look in other agencies, but it's still the same thing. So that's kind of how we look at it at corrections, just long hours, uh, understaffing, population mm-hmm. problems, and then you're dealing with your home life. Uh, that's what a lot of uh, me being a manager, managing people that have not gone through that before. Yeah. It's their first time going into a situation where you're working 12, 16 hour days and it, it becomes longer. That's kind of the way we see it from the correctional aspect. Um, From the education educator standpoint, when I think of compassion fatigue, I think of just having the biggest heart uh, for all the situations and scenarios that we see on a daily basis. But our energy is depleted. Um, We still have the compassion for it, but it's it's we're limited on what we can do. Our resources are depleted. We're working with little as it is. And it's like, oh, here's here's another here's another situation we got to deal with. But what do we have to deal with it? And it kind of puts you in a cycle of hopelessness. Hopelessness. Absolutely. How does compassion fatigue develop in your work environments or in work environments other than yours that you just recognize that it's prevalent in this area? I think for us, how does it just develop? It's just just dealing with the staffing. Uh, how I say that's just budget budget things that that are not controlled. I mean, you talk about the criminal justice reform type concept. Honestly, we have more incarcerated people than we have the staffing to to do that. Now, that's kind of one of those issues that's above us. But that's some of the ways that those things get developed is longer hours. Uh, they have, and you know, all of them have. Uh, well, not all of the inmates, but there's going to be inmates that have mental health issues, inmates that have medical issues, and they have to get care. So that's other bodies that we have to resource out to go other places. So developing uh, some of that's just those long hours that we can't really are unexpected. Mm-hmm. For me personally, just kind of at our facility, 
I could start out with enough bodies to operate, mm-hmm. but it can easily change because I can't predict what's going to happen. I, I can't. That's one behavior that you can't expect of what's going to happen. And developing some of those things are just, to me, it's just kind of a lot of issues from the mental health aspect, uh, dealing with that medication and dealing with people getting injured, longer hours. Uh, Let's talk about what we're dealing with now, the COVID pandemic, homeschooling. So you have to run your your daily job along with doing what you need to do at home. And as an essential employee, which we all stand, is there, there you're having to work, find that work-life balance. That's a lot of the development that we have is that work-life balance. Kind of unpredictable with time. There's not enough time in the day to, to balance those two, in my opinion. How do you see, so for you, V, how do you see... Compassion fatigue and burnout show up. What does it look like when people are in that state? When you're in that state, um, especially as a public servant or any kind of service job, um, even the even the greeter at Walmart, when when compassion fatigue sets in, I, there's a there is no compassion. Like humanity is just on a lower level. Um, we're not as kind. We're not as patient. Uh, it changes everything. Even if you feel it in your heart, it's not what's coming out. Uh, maybe people are more short. Um, today, even uh, with some of my colleagues, I was like, you know what, guys, we got to step back for a second. I think we're all just tired. We got to see each other more than we see our families. And so I think when fatigue sets in, you just have to really step back and think, you know, about how we're speaking to each other, how we're interacting with each other. It affects, like like Sanchez says, it affects everything. So I think when that sets in, we're a little bit more shorter. We're not as patient. We're not as kind. And when you're a public servant or you're in any kind of service position, um, those things are necessary. And we're in the middle of a pandemic. So right now we need everyone to be a little more kind. We need everyone to be a little more patient. Everybody's working with less. And so it's definitely, this is a great topic. Thank you. So it's it's so key what you said. We're in the middle of a pandemic. It is a difficult time for everyone. And so much grace is necessary and required for us to just kind of get through it together. Challenging thing is, though, is that because of the nature of the pandemic and everything that's happening, people are more likely to fall into compassion fatigue and burnout because of just everything that they're dealing with, uh, because of the overabundance of having to deal with things. You think about the medical professionals, educators, correctional facilities, customer service uh, representatives, all those types of industries where uh, on a normal basis, Mm -hmm. they have a, you know, a lot coming at them, but it's even more now. So what are some things that industries, what are some things that leadership can do or need to be doing or thinking about to help with this so that we can get through it together? I think it's being more uh, having those conversations like we're having today. Seriously, just just putting that topic out there and defining it and having that conversation is already a big step towards uh, when I go through some of the things that uh, when I talk to the officers, we look at it and have that conversation. It, it, you may not want to have that conversation immediately, but we're still going to have that conversation. So just by them doing that training, being honest, being in and just like what we're doing now and talking to each other amongst it, there might be an experience that I've dealt with that that person, I, I might have to guide them or show them, hey, it's OK to feel this way. It's OK to go this way. And what can we do to help you? So I think industries need to just look at the training aspect. Mm -hmm. But as we all know in training, training only goes as far as you invest in it. So if it's not an investment. Say that again for the people in the back. The the investment. (laughs) You have to be invested in it for it not to for it to work. And you have to show that it's an investment towards your people, Mm -hmm. towards the organization. And then that that'll that'll speak uh, a lot to to the to the employees and I know we try to do that very very much in the department and we talk about it and we ask people and we have resources out there to give them so just having that conversation to me is the biggest thing it sounds easier said than done but I think a lot of people don't have that conversation appreciate that um and to piggyback off of what Sanchez says fostering community Leadership needs to foster community within their organizations and make sure that everyone has a seat at the table from the CEO to the janitor. Everyone needs to be able to have a seat at the table to air their grievances, talk about what's going on, have the difficult conversations and work to a solution instead of uh, just solution coming down. If everyone feels like they have a part or they had a say. 
in some small part, then I think that would help because right now that's community is what's really going to help us out. We need each other. So taking the steps to establish buy-in um, yes. from the ranks will help people in that place. One of the things that we talked about prior to was some of the other areas. Um, Captain Sanchez, you mentioned avoidance and B, you talked about boundaries. Mm -hmm. Whichever one of you wants to go first, talk to me from that place and how that plays a role in um, compassion fatigue, what it is um, and what we need to do about it. Uh, I think with avoidance, it's just kind of looking at knowing your employees. Uh, a lot of us managers go out and of course we're going to check what the work production is going on, but we're also going to check on individuals and on a personal level. How is your life going? What are you dealing with? Once again, it goes back to that investment. For the avoidance part, I don't think we naturally avoid it. It's just an uncomfortable topic. We're just like, hey, you're strong enough to deal with it. And we want to look at it. So it becomes a personal thing, such as, well, I could deal with it. Why can't they deal with it? Mm -hmm. And that's not everybody's uh, everybody's personality. So you might have dealt with it, but that person didn't deal with it. So each, each person is an individual, mm -hmm. and we have to treat that person as an individual. So the avoidance part, I don't think we naturally want to. We're just expecting, and we make assumptions that, oh, well, they didn't say anything. So they they're, they're okay. Mm -hmm. And then uh, we have situations for us where then we're at a crossroads where it might be too late now. Now we've dealt with, you know, whether it's substance abuse or something like that. And we're now having a different conversation where we would have had it a little bit before. I can't predict the future, but we might have taken some steps to reduce that. And when you're talking about dealt with it, we're talking about specific traumas that a person might experience exactly. right in the work or whatever they might do. And and I, I, I say, I don't have any like necessarily scientific thing to back this up, but trauma has big T trauma and little T trauma. Exactly. And that we need to start seeing it as more than just these major events. Even though what we're talking about here also includes those big traumas, especially in, in correctional industries or medical professions, those types of things. But to attach it also to some of these other smaller seed traumas that come in from other experiences and people's coping mechanisms for how they deal with those things. And those things get avoided because I should be strong enough to deal with this. Exactly. Because then you're looking at. Oh, uh, well, uh, if it didn't happen to him, and unfortunately in the corrections, it's kind of like you're with a partner, so if they were okay with it, I'm yeah. going to use that peer pressure aspect. Well, I should be okay with it because everyone else is done with it. Or if you ask that question, they look at you a certain way like, hey, is that okay? Well, if this guy's done it for five years, let's just say experience-wise, and this isn't his first uh, self-harm or, or attempted suicide or some of those things that have happened, He's dealt with it already, and this person hasn't. Mm -hmm. So they're like, oh, I'm used to that. And that's where it goes to what she was talking about, was kind of being desensitized to the situation. Mm -hmm. And it does happen. Okay. So, Talk to me about boundaries, B. When we talk about boundaries, um, like I said, it, it almost sounds selfish uh, when you say it, but for us to be servants, you know, I always say there's three C's in customer service. I always say there's care. Concern, but competency has to be there. You still have to do your job, but I, I just don't think any of them work without the care and the concern. And so a lot of times for us to do our jobs effectively um, and not be burnout, we got to have boundaries. And uh, one of my boundaries, I must take care of myself first. I can't give anything uh, to those students that will be in my class if I don't take care of myself first. And so I could stay up and watch Netflix all night, but I've even started to go to bed earlier because I know that the more sleep that I get, the more care, the more concern, the less fatigue I'm going to be. And then I'm going to be competent enough to do my job, but I got to take care of myself first. And so that means doing those things and making those decisions that will make me a better teacher. Uh, there are people, the people that they're, they're allowing me to teach their children. And so they're trusting me with their children. And so I've got to be trusted to take care of myself first. Absolutely. And so what I'm hearing um, in, in both of these examples, when it comes to addressing avoidance, when it comes to establishing boundaries, these are some tips. These are some things that people can do when they find that they're in compassion fatigue or they are experiencing burnout. What are some things that uh, 
we need to be looking at, things that we need to be thinking about when it comes to work-life balance. You mentioned having to work long hours, but then still needing to come home and take care of home and how these dueling responsibilities and priorities can also contribute to it. What do we do? I think it starts with the people that you're having the conversation with. It's like uh, it's simple problem solving. Uh, identify the problem. Let's get people in the room and get their proposals. Have their input into what you're, the conversation you're having. It starts, how can I solve a problem without talking to the individuals it's affecting directly? Mm-hmm. Now, not every problem is going to get solved because there has to be a, a kind of, you know, whether it's economically, whether it's reasonable, mm-hmm. uh, we can have those conversations. But I think you told us earlier kind of what you would tell other people in the industries. It's having the conversations with people. Uh, going down there and speaking to the people would be probably my primary thing because they're, they're not going to be open at first. But if they start showing that you're trying to have that conversation, find a work. Hey, you tell me what we could do as a department or as a as an organization or as a company that would assess that situation with your work life. Is it child care that we could provide? Is it uh, more... Uh, Counseling sessions for whatever you're going through. Those are the things we're talking about. I know with the Department of Corrections, we have what we call One Life, which is a great outlet, which talks. It's an employee assistance program. So we definitely promote that and say, hey, look, if you're going through it, you don't have feel comfortable with me. Those kind of things that you need to provide and find from other sources and get that input from them so that they know, OK, now, now you're listening to me. Because uh, with everyone I've come, it's a people business. I agree with her. Uh, totally uh, about the care concern. Well, if I can't take care of myself, how am I going to do my job and provide for my family? Absolutely. So it starts with me. But if you're just out of it, can't function, whether it affects you health-wise, mental-wise, mental health-wise, now you have a bigger problem in your hand. I always tell our officers and, and our chief of security tells them all the time, you know, this place is going to function with or without you. We appreciate your service, but we need you before we need this place. We need you to be taken care of before you can take care of anyone else. That is such an amazing thing that your staff get to hear. Yes. And I'm going to speak for our audience. Um, <laughs> right. Me too. Like, I'm going to work there. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm going to speak for our audience who's going to say, hey, that's not my situation, right? Like, that's not my experience and my leadership wouldn't care or they believe that this is the case. And I think it's so very important to you all's point that... We're talking about this from the perspective of people and us as individuals and what all we need to do. But hopefully we can have a a conversation that leadership can hear and recognize some of the roles that they can take and some of the different things, small things. We're we're all trying to do more with less. Mm -hmm. So it's not a matter of us trying to figure out how to add something to our plate. How do we take what we have and recognize the needs of the people? And then do what we can to prevent this so that people can keep showing up to do what we're here to do and, and continue to serve. What if I start to notice that I'm fitting into the, the category of compassion fatigue or burnout? What are some of the things that I can do to kind of curb that, the effect of that and, and get on top of it? One of the first things you can do is stop, <laughs> reflect, and find someone to talk to. And that's why that's just like Sanchez says, it comes back in again, the conversation, whether it's a tr- trusted colleague, EAP, Uh, get it out. Someone in your home, a friend, the conversation is where it starts. If you start to see that you're getting there, then it's time to talk. You know, I, I think about the doctor when COVID first began, the doctor that contracted COVID, Um, Her heart was so much for the patients and everything they were going through and everything that was around her. And it was just overwhelming. And then for her to get COVID, too, and then subsequently die by suicide, you have to think that it was overwhelming. So we have to make it available for first responders and, and people in service positions to have someone to talk to and get those feelings out and then let them know it's normal. Uh, for the listeners, if you're listening, do not be afraid to talk to someone. The conversation is where it starts. Find someone. And the recognition that it's not a sign of incompetency. No. That this is not, does not mean that you're not doing a good job or that you, it's, it, it actually, to me, means that you're probably excelling in your job and that you have a level of care for it that is valuable, that is necessary, 
but we have to create those boundaries to keep you safe as a person from all that you are having to deal with. Human. Exactly. Compassion fatigue has been described as the cost of caring. It's deep physical and emotional exhaust, emotional exhaustion. What I think is interesting about that is that we understand what happens in a workplace environment or in a family environment or, you know, whatever environment when a person just gets tired. A person's just physically exhausted, their productivity, their ability to focus, all those things are diminished um, because of the state that they're in. Compassion fatigue is an emotional exhaustion. How much more is that going to have an impact on productivity, on well-being, on a person's physical health and other mental health types of things? It just seems like a mental health rabbit hole. Uh, it, it, you know, you go from f- mental exhaustion to physical exhaustion to feelings of worthlessness, and that starts to lead to mental health disorders like depression, uh, major depressive disorder. In 2017, we lost 756 Oklahomans to suicide. Even more urgent, right now, as we record this podcast, it remains the second leading cause of death for Oklahomans ages 15 to 34, and it's the fourth leading cause of death for ages 35 to 44. Oklahoma is the 13th highest rate of suicide in the country. People are tired. And uh, to share my story, one before, I, I, I'm lived experienced. I survived a suicide attempt. And one thing that I remember saying all the time is I used to always say, I'm just so tired. Tired emotionally, tired physically, just tired. Mm-hmm. And, and, and I just really lost hope. And I, and I don't want us to lose hope uh, with everything that's going on. I'm glad we're addressing it. Absolutely. What about you, Captain Sanchez? What does that look like for you? Uh, Unfortunately, it's kind of the same environment for corrections. Um, I know probably within the last two years, we've lost two two officers. Um, I know, like we, you know, we talk about signs. They seem normal. They seem like conversations. They're like, hey, the individual's always happy, always checking on others. So it goes kind of, it's it just always reverts back to what? They're checking on others, but who's checking on that individual? Wow. It's, it's always that conversation where, you know, we talk about signs. I'm not saying not every person that you talk to, oh, well, they're checking on me. There's probably something going on, but the signs are very telling. So I tell people and even, you know, other agencies that like you were discussing is, Going down, I think sometimes our environment as manager is going down there to those individuals that you're not going to always see. Mm-hmm. Those people behind those doors, those people behind those uh, that aren't doing that. You're like, oh, well, that's just such and such. Well, have you talked to such and such? I'm not saying you can make it a priority, whether it's once a month meeting with people. It's that once again, goes back to that compassion fatigue. How can I figure out? Well, you can obviously see it physically. There are going to be some signs that you can see that you can say, okay, are you okay, man? Are you feeling all right? Those simple just conversations of let's not ask about the production. Let's ask about you. That's that's the key point, in my opinion, that could prevent that one conversation might be that day that we all have bad days. I always tell my officers, hey, you're having a bad day. Your, your car won't start. You lost your keys. And then the first thing, you're running late. This is the second day. You're going to have that's life. Mm-hmm. But then when they get there and then they got in trouble for something or they were late, just say, hey, are you okay? All right. All right. Now let's talk about what what happened. That's just counseling 101, in my opinion. That's some of that leadership styles that organizations need to know. Before we talk about what we messed up, let's talk about how they're doing. Because there might be a situation you're not aware of. Like whether it's financially, that's their only car, um, they're out of gas money. Hey, how many kids do you have? Some people are not going to give their personal business, but just checking on them. Mm -hmm. I don't need to know your your life story, but if you want to tell me your life story, then I'll sit here and listen for five minutes. It's not going to hurt me. Listen for five minutes. Absolutely. Five minutes might have saved something. It's preventable. I like what he says. Suicide is preventable. And I, I like you said, that one conversation, you, they could have been having that one bad day that would end everything. And somebody just said, are you OK? 
changes everything. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Because what we started at in the beginning of the conversation is one of the most impactful ways to address this is conversation. It's community. It's support. It's not feeling alone in this. It's being able to come to someone and say, I am tired and not, I need to go take a nap tired. I am tired within my being. How do I deal with this? A lot of us have never seen it. We've never experienced it. I'm imagining that there are so many people now who consider themselves strong and now they're questioning their abilities in the midst of what we're going through right now. And it has absolutely nothing to do with your strength. And I okay. think as males, uh, just kind of to intervene, as males, we need to stop looking at it as a prideful thing. And that's one of the biggest aspects. Uh, speaking as a male, understanding it's okay to ask for help because you're no help if you can't ask for help and you're not going to assist your loved ones, your wife, your daughter in any way if you're not accessible. So a lot of times, even in corrections from males and females, it becomes a prideful thing. And it's like, hey, no, I, I always tell our guys, hey, it's okay to have a conversation. Are you good? Are you sure? I'd rather be that nuisance of asking than not be that nuisance of asking. I think we males struggle with that. I, I can't if 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 I'm not fit emotionally, physically, then what am I doing? And and what I what I'm also hearing in that is that we all need to make space. Mm -hmm. We need to yes. make space for it to be safe mm -hmm. to feel. So often we function from the place that says work is work. And home is home. And we've said emotions and feeling only belong at home, mm -hmm. if even there. And what we're having to do, uh, you mentioned uh, when you were talking earlier, Captain Sanchez, talking about the productivity and checking in on the person. We have got to take the necessary steps to balance people and productivity and to focus on both aspects um, because they're equally important, but if you don't have the people, the productivity doesn't matter. You hit the key point. And we have to make the space to say it's okay to feel because feeling is a part of being people. And so we can't remove those things. Otherwise, what we find is a dehumanization. And we and then and then we have people in unfortunately in different social services, correctional facilities, even in, in education. And, and as public servants, we see this unfortunately too often. The tiredness, the the and, and it's uh, why we're having this conversation right now because we know in the midst of this COVID environment, it's even worse. Talk to me about that piece as far as how leaders can prioritize or should prioritize or just some simple steps that they can start taking now to start moving towards a culture that creates space for people to be people. I work at a, a charter middle school and we had a situation and we had meetings this morning. And when we came in, the principal gets on the intercom and says, hey, I know we had this stuff scheduled, but before we get started, let's just all meet up and have a conversation. Totally took all the, uh, just broke up the monotony, what everybody was going and had their minds stressed on it. Just took a minute to be human and say, I know this is what we're dealing with. We're going to be okay. Everybody go to work. And I don't know, but that made me feel better because when I came in, I was tired, not tired. I was tired. <laughs> COVID, co COVID done made us tired. <laughs> we can't even get all the syllables in. And, and so I came in with a heaviness and that heaviness and that fatigue was because I knew what I was going to do when the meeting started at nine. I knew it. And then from your leader to break that up and say, this is important. You are important. And didn't take a long time, just a couple of minutes, but it changed the day. Um, you know, right now we're in a in a situation something that we kind of do. We have those morning meetings. Unfortunately, you can't have it with everyone. I know it's just kind of finding your space. You know, if you're a CEO and you have someone in charge of that, letting them take that leadership role. I know for, for my shift, something that we do monthly is kind of we acknowledge two individuals that we see that have done outstanding. We provide them something potluck. It's nothing major, but it's something that everyone feels included on. Recognition to me would be the biggest thing that I tell people. A simple, hey, you did a great job. I, I saw you today means a lot. That's your future leader. That's why I think mm -hmm. we lose we lose aspect is you're building 
your future leaders. So where you start it and what you lay down is what you're going to receive later on. Any other thoughts, anything else that you'd like to comment on as it relates to compassion fatigue, burnout, words of encouragement for, for public servants out there who are dedicated to the citizens of Oklahoma and just getting a little tired? I would like to encourage those listening to not get tired. We're necessary. We're needed. Uh, my thing would be I just encourage everyone to know that someone is always available. We cannot do compassion fatigue and burnout justice in this time span, but I hope that what we've been able to do is introduce it and communicate about it and start the conversation. The conversation is the step that's necessary so that we can start doing what we need to do. Thank you again. Uh, tell us how listeners can connect with you, uh, social media platforms, if there's any other types of contact or questions or services that you can offer and provide. For me, uh, mental health, suicide prevention, even educational tools, you can connect with me at www.bsmith.live. That's B-E-E smith.live um, and I'm on be, at Be Inspired Talk on Instagram, Twitter and pretty much all social media platforms. Uh, for myself you can just uh, reach me at uh, uh, Juan, J-U-A-N dot Sanchez at D-O-C dot O-K dot G-O-V uh, I'd gladly appreciate any questions that you have and uh, hopefully I can give you direction on where to go and, and have a conversation also. Thank you, V. Smith. Thank you, Captain Sanchez, for your time. It has been a pleasure. Until next time, this is Tanisha Haynes at a seat at the table. Thank you for joining us. Today's podcast is sponsored by the State Certified Facilitator Program, now offering best practices and resources for facilitating on a virtual platform. To become a State Certified Facilitator, email statewide learning services using the email address SLS training at omes.ok.gov or visit us at learn.ok.gov music provided by bensound.com until next time keep on learning